I'll be speaking about a case in which all this played out. And the title of the talk is Three Match Statistics, One Verdict. This was a case that both I and Robin Cotton testified in. Again, this work was done by Cybergenetics for Prosecutor using Trulio, which is a commercial product. The case is Commonwealth, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania versus Kevin Foley. In April of 2006, Blairville dentist John Yelenick was brutally slashed to death and bled out in his home. Uh, a year and a half later, Pennsylvania State Trooper Kevin Foley was charged with a homicide. Here's Kevin Foley. Uh, he's wearing his University of Pittsburgh t-shirt. In February of 2008, they, had, they went to, before a judge, and there are 13 million people in the state of Pennsylvania, and so the defense questioned why a 13,000 CPI inclusion match score was all that helpful. Now, the DNA evidence was the key evidence in the case. The DNA came from under the victim's fingernails. He scratched somebody. Um, and there are two contributors to this DNA mixture. Uh, look, the computer tells us it's a 93% victim and 6.7% unknown. A lot of DNA, one nanogram. Uh, STR analysis was done by the Quantico lab uh, with Profiler Plus and Cofiler. And we know the victim's contributor genotype because we have the victim. Computer, uh, computer interpretation was done by Trulio and by other methods that we'll see uh, using quantitative addition to infer the unknown contributor genotype. And afterwards, like with all other methods, objectively it was compared with a suspect genotype. Now, interestingly, there are three different match statistics here. The inclusion method that the FBI offered was 13,000. Robin Cotton's obligate allele subtraction method gave 23 million. And quantitative computer interpretation using statistical methods gave 189 billion. So the question that was before the court was, why are there different match results? Or how do these different mixture interpretation methods differ? And what should we present in court? And that's what I will endeavor to explain in the remainder of the talk. So what's the, the critical difference between these different interpretation methods? Well, it involves how the data is used. An inclusion method do, does not use the victim profile, nor does it use quantitative data, right? Every pair has equal share. A subtraction or obligate allele method does use the victim profile and, again, gives every pair equal share, uh, whereas using all the information that's been presented from the crime scene, quantitatively, we do have the victim profile. Uh, we can see him, uh, you'll see in the data in 10 minutes, his peaks dominating every profile this, from his fingernails. Moreover, uh, we have the concept that a better fit's more likely it. We use the quantitative data. There was a Fry hearing, and the Fry hearing involved general acceptance in the relevant community, and it was determined uh, by the court that the relevant community comprised the statisticians, mathematicians, and various scientists who develop, test, discuss, publish on, and present uh, DNA interpretation methods. We showed articles about quantitative STR uh, peak information, how that was, has been standard for 20 years. Genotype probability distributions have been around since Mendel. Goes back a while. Uh, computer interpretation of STR data has been around for t uh, 20 years. More articles on that. Statistical and modeling and com computation with uh, modern uh, modeling and search has really come into its own in the last 20 years and pretty much dominates much of scientific inquiry in physics, social sciences, economics, gene chips, and so on. That was easy to describe. The likelihood ratio literature uh, going back to uh, the Turing and Goods work in the 1950s. Uh, the concept of some jurisdictions that mixture interpretations are always admissible, but merely subject to cross-examination. Uh, there are a number of computer systems that do mixture deconvolution, and of course, we described Trulio. We also described the results of some uh, studies that we had done on uh, NIST data on an NIJ grant, and the paper uh, came out last year. It was published in PLOS One, discusses a lot of things, but one, I'll, I'll describe what the data are. So we had a bunch of DNA mixtures, known samples, uh, diluted, 
Uh, so Margaret, I uh, can go into the whole data, but essentially we have a bunch of known two-person mixtures, different dilutions, and therefore for each one, we know how much DNA is present from the culprit, the one that we're going to be looking for. Uh, this is on a log scale. For each one, we can analyze it by any means. In the study, we actually did inclusion, likelihood, uh, CLR, we did two unknown, one unknown. Here I'm just showing true allele, uh, assuming the victim looking for one unknown quantitatively. And this is the amount of likelihood ratio information that came out, the information gained, plotted on a logarithmic chart. And what you see is a straight line as you move to the left. This is the 100 picogram level beyond which uh, humans often publish they dare not tread. Um, but, the, but if you look at the regression line, you see that down to about 15 picograms of DNA, you're getting a usable result of over a million to one likelihood ratio. Well, we can also use this to predict what would happen. We had 1,000 picograms of DNA, a 6.7% mixture. 67 picograms lies here. We look up, if we had 15 loci, we'd expect about a quadrillion as our max strength. 12 loci were used, so we end up with about a trillion. Our number is in the hundreds of billions. So the defense contention that all match statistics should give the same low information as CPI was not persuasive. We could predict from our calibration data pretty much what the match statistic would be. Uh, when I testified in the case, I explained to the jury uh, why these methods were expected by science. Essentially, if you use more data in, you'll get more information out. And truly, as far as we can make it do it, it uses all of the available DNA data, stutter, relative amplification, uh, quantitative peaks, and so on. The analogy that seemed to be somewhat persuasive was a microscope. If you take a microscope slide and you're looking for pneumonia or you know, you're looking for something, if you look at it with the naked eye, you'll see the slide. If you're looking at it with a, uh, a magnifying glass, maybe you go on to the next level with the victim, you'll see a bit more. And if you use the appropriate microscope, you'll diagnose the bacterium and know how to treat the disease. So all the computer's doing is it's providing a better microscope on the same data. So here's some data. All these uh, pictures are snapshots from the Truallele interface. So, uh, for the mixture weight, we see its probability distribution. Here it is. It's spent at around 6.7% with a standard deviation of about 1%. There's some tables that confirm that. This is the inferred genotype. What you're seeing is that each locus is a probability distribution of the 100 or so possible allele pairs which were most probable. Some have a probability of about one. That's because there are four allele cases. It's easy if you have the victim to get that answer. Others are less informative, and others look a little more diffuse. As we'll see, uh, compared with inclusion methods, overall it's much more informative. But no match has been done yet. This is the same inferred genotype from the data that you could then take and match against a population, uh, a, a population of suspects of 10 million uh, convicted offenders, or you could compare it against one suspect in the case. It's objectively inferred without knowing what the victim is. This is the match information that you get at every locus. Black means that it's positive. This is on a log scale. Uh, going up 10 and 100, and you see it's positive in every case, and because it's logarithms, you add it up and you get about 100 billion. Let's go in a bit further and take a look at one locus and see what the data look like. Here's the locus D8. Um, towering over everything else is the victim's profile. He's 93%, and there are uh, at alleles 12 and 14, that is his genotype. Now, down here, we see some other low-level events. These might be stutter. The one in 15, probably not stutter. It's probably something real. And any obligate method would say, well, that 15 has to be there. So there's an explain interface. Uh, it's nice when computers can explain their thinking visually. So here, it's, you can do what-if analyses. But here we see in gray, this is the genotype of the victim. 12, 14, at 93 percent. These little blue guys, you can move around wherever you want, and then a pattern will get generated from that using statistical modeling that accounts for stutter, relative amplification, degraded DNA, and so on. When the hypothesis of 12, 15 is put in, we get a pattern that very closely, shown in gray, matches the data shown in green. Uh, 
other patterns that are possible, maybe a homozygote at 15. When we do a likelihood comparison, which we can do in the report interface, we see in dark blue the quantitative likelihood. A better fit's more likely it. 90% of the probability ends up at 1215. This is inclusion. We can upload anything into the system, including what inclusion would have done, so I'm showing it to you. It dissipates its probability over six possible allele pairs constructed from the three alleles, following identical inference, but a different rule, a different philosophy. Every pair gets equal share. And in that process, you see the reduction of the probability from 90% to 17% when you don't place more definite uh, belief based on the data, but instead try to be fair. Notice that these three out of the six don't include allele 15, which any obligate review would want to. This is what a report looks like generated from the system. And I, I, this wasn't what we did at trial, but we have it now, so I put in co-ancestry with a theta of 0.1. And the likelihood ratio at each allele is the probability after divided by the probability uh, before. And we can see that uh, with D8. So if you take a look at the row for D8, you'll see that the, at the allele pair 12, 15, which matches the suspect, before we looked at the data, the probability in the population was 3.6%. Afterwards, the probability is about 90%. 90% 90 divided by 3.6% is a likelihood ratio of about 25. That's the likelihood ratio. Now we take the log of it, it's 1.4, add them all up, and now you have the joint information from the independent locus experiments, which is about 100 billion. This we showed at trial. It showed that more information in leads to more data that you're considering leads to more information out. Uh, inclusion, in, shown in purple, is low level across all the loci. Uh, when Robin Cotton did her obligate allele analysis, subtracting out the victim, you see that the, the two tall orange peaks matching up with the blue are giving you, from four alleles, a pretty much unique answer. And, and true allele is pulling out what Robin did, but it's also getting D8 with more information, D18 and some other loci. And in the end, you go from four orders of magnitude of the 10,000 of inclusion to 10 million uh, when you consider the victim to another four orders of magnitude to 10 to the 11th or 100 billion when you uh, use quantitative information at all. So what did we learn from the case? Well, this was an objective review that never saw the suspect. It was easy to testify about in court. We. One of the reasons it was easy is we always had genotypes. We could point to the genotypes, show the data, Robin did this, we did this. Um, the concepts of information gain and of how much data goes in and how much information comes out was quite understandable to the judge and the jury. This, by the way, was not a sophisticated Manhattan jury. This, the jury was located an hour and a half of P Pittsburgh. I don't know how sophisticated you think Pittsburgh is, but one step removed. Um, but the, Defense attorney kept saying there's no precedent. Well, now there's precedent. Uh, computers that do this stuff have been admitted into uh, evidence and testified to. The key thing is that it's not creating anything that isn't there. It's merely preserving the identification information that's in the data. We know the victim's profile. We know the quantitative peaks. They're all there. And perhaps the greatest lesson learned was that presenting multiple match statistics to the jury was fine. We didn't decide for them, he did it. We didn't decide for them some binary decision of inclusion or exclusion. What was presented were three different likelihood ratios, CPI, obligate allele, and quantitative, each based on certain assumptions that were easily explainable to a jury. So what's the verdict? Well, after uh, Kevin Foley valiantly testified in his defense, there was still one piece of physical evidence that didn't jive with the story that he wasn't there. As the prosecutor said, it was the DNA. He scratched his assailant and he captured his DNA. Uh, we describe this as a newsletter that we have that talks about this case in more detail if you want to see it. So the verdict of the, of the having seen likelihood ratios of like 100 billion of the jur jury was he was guilty of first degree murder. And now, as a forensic science community, 
you've looked at the studies we've done with likelihood ratios of quantitative to non-quantitative of a million or a billion to one. You've seen cases that are coming out. And the ultimate verdict is going to be decided based on, I hope, likelihood ratios and objective information. What are the most informative methods you can use to reliably process your evidence with efficacy and reproducibility? But the verdict's up to you. I can't decide that for you. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.